Hello, we're going to look at desoldering. That's the process by which we remove parts or faulty components from printed circuit boards. We can use a range of tools to assist us in doing that. These would include soldering braid or solder wick, desoldering pumps and guns, hot air rework stations, chip quick, tweezers, perhaps even a heat gun. What is the right temperature to desolder? Well, there isn't one. And that's because it's affected by the mass of the component, the type of solder that has been used, and whether or not the component is on a ground plane or a multi-layered printed circuit board. All of these combine to make it impossible to actually say there is one specific temperature to do the work. But effectively it should be as low as you can make it while still melting the solder fairly quickly. My typical settings for my iron are around 330 to 360 Celsius and 350 to 380 for my hot air workstation. What I'm going to demonstrate is the way that I personally like to do things. There's no right or wrong way providing you can get the job done without um, causing any damage to the rest of the equipment or indeed to the printed circuit board itself. Let's now look at the various methods in order of simplicity. The soldering braid or solder wick is a general purpose cheap and easy to use tool. Made from thin copper wires it's very similar to the outer braiding found on coaxial cables and it's usually pre-coated with flux. It comes in rolls of varying thickness from about 1 to 6 millimeters, and it's used in combination with your soldering iron. When used over a solder joint, the solder melts and the flux of the braid draws the solder from the PCB into the braided copper through capillary action. It's not reusable, you simply cut off and discard the used part and start with the next fresh section. It does work, uh, and it works well, but it is slow, since each joint must be worked on individually and carefully, as you do run the risk of damaging pads or tracks if you drag the wick across them too roughly. A very popular tool with hobbyists is the solder sucker or desoldering pump. It's a manually operated tool and you can use it to remove solder at the press of a button. It uses suction created by these rubber seals which are pulled up the inside of the tube when the spring is released and in the process it draws any molten solder that's placed in front of the heat resistant nozzle into the tube. Here you can see the uh, soldering iron heating up the solder on the pad and then once it goes molten the solder sucker is introduced and released. You will also see that um, as my eyes are not getting any younger uh, I also make use of this uh, magnifying light which is extremely useful in the workshop. So now that we have run the solder sucker over all the joints. Um, when it's now time to see if we can actually extract the component. And to do that I'm going to use uh, one of a number of tools I use for this purpose. Um, there would be my favourite tool here which is uh, just a scraper. You can also get this on a 45 degree angle version as well. Um, different types of either picks or spring hooks which are very useful when you're trying to get underneath something. Um, let's see if we can get... There we go. Solder suckers do require a little maintenance. On occasions the solder solidifies in the nozzle and it blocks. So to clear it you need to unscrew 
the nozzle and then pay per careful attention there is a, a little o-ring there which helps to maintain a good seal so that the vacuum is maintained and then using either a small jeweler's screwdriver or a set of cleaning uh, blades for different nozzle thicknesses uh, these are widely available in all good electronic shops you would run the cleaning blade in the same direction of travel as a solder and until you would dislodge it and and remove it in which case you then reassemble your solder pump and you're ready to go again this is my desoldering station it's a dual tool unit and it costs about 80 pounds it's available from CPC or Amazon or even eBay it consists of a main unit which allows you to precisely set the temperature of the heating element and the main unit also contains the vacuum pump which is uh, an, uh, driven by an electric motor and it's triggered by the trigger on the gun so it's best thought of as a combination of both a soldering iron and a desolder pump it has the ability to melt solder and to immediately suck this solder away from the circuit board instead of using a manual system like the desoldering pump this uses the electric motor to create the vacuum the front of the gun has a nozzle, a hollow nozzle and when you bring this into contact with a solder joint the solder will melt once that happens you press the trigger and you'll hear the motor start that creates a vacuum and draws the molten solder through the device and into the waste solder chamber so let's see it in operation I've now resoldered back in the 3.5 millimeter socket because I want to compare the difference in speed when I'm using the electronic solder pump I've had it on it's up to temperature it's currently 340 degrees I don't uh, need my magnifying lens quite so much when I'm using this uh, particular tool because it is very efficient so put it on give it a second for the heat to come up and you can hear the compressor running and it is beneficial to actually work the component leg in small circles and I think you can actually hear the uh, air coming through the the th in fact you can see there it's actually dropped out of the board without any assistance tremendous tool can't uh, recommend it enough like the manual desoldering pump this electronic desoldering station also needs some preventative maintenance the glass capsule here is the used solder receptacle and periodically you will need to remove this and clean out the contents <coughs> and at the same time it would be beneficial to replace the filters which also reside at the back of this just to make sure that uh, they're not clogged and you're getting the maximum suction that is possible out of the device the other thing which can give uh, problems would be the nozzle uh, fortunately they are easy to replace and it's always useful to have at least one or two of them in stock it's simply there's uh, the heating element there so there's a cover goes over that the new nozzle would go into place and 
it's a matter of just tightening up the retaining nut at the bottom. It's useful to use a range of different cleaning blades to actually poke through the nozzle and uh, make sure that it is um, both totally open and, and clean. Hot air stations are very useful tools and are essential for any electronics workbench, especially when working with surface mount devices. They range in price from 40 to well over £2,000, depending on the features and the build quality of that particular unit. They can be purchased from CPC, Amazon and other online electronics suppliers. This is my hot air rework station. It's aimed at the hobby market and cost around £120. It's a combination unit and also contains a temperature controlled soldering iron. Besides a hot air station, you'll need a few other tools, especially if you're working with surface mount components. The same accessories I used with solder pumps can again be used. Tweezer choices will depend on the job and your personal preference, and as before, flux is essential. There are also specialised ranges of SMD tools which use suction to make it easier to pick up or place these small components. To protect your workbench, I recommend you use either a heat resistant material like MDF or, as in my case, a silicone mat. Before starting any hot air work, to avoid making what could be a very costly mistake, I strongly recommend you practice on a scrap circuit board until you're proficient using the tool for desoldering. Before you switch on the station, you need to check if the nozzle fitted to the wand is the appropriate size and shape for the job. It's much easier to do this when the wand is cold. The nozzle attaches to the front of the wand and it's secured in place using a screw. I'm not going to demo the soldering iron side of the unit, safe to say it does work very well. It can provide hot air at temperatures ranging from 100 to 500 degrees centigrade. There are two control knobs, one for temperature and the one for airflow. The readout displays the set temperature and then the current temperature. As with all methods of desoldering, metal heat sinks and PCBs with ground planes can make reworking take a lot longer. In practice, you set the temperature slightly higher than the melting point of the solder. And don't use too much air or you risk blowing the part off the board. Once the wand has come to the operating temperature, you slowly move the wand back and forth over the component to be removed. I have the airflow set a little too high. As you can see, the component's been blown from the PCB whenever the solder becomes molten. Bear in mind that hot air is, well, it's hot, so mind your fingers. Make sure to keep the hot air wand moving to prevent any damage either to the component or to the circuit board. Obviously, if you see smoke, warping or black goo coming from your board, remove the heat and turn your heat setting down. You can also use capon tape 
to help shield components which are close to the part to be removed. Capon tape is a registered DuPont trademark. The generic eBay version is polyamide. Uh, it's commonly used to protect electrical components during soldering. You can also use a, a sharp blade to cut a window in the capon tape. I use this quite often when I'm working on a, a PCB and need to remove a specific component and there are others very tightly packed around it. This method works uh, fairly well. This is Chipquick. It's an alloy that you can melt and mix with existing solder on the pins of a component. It significantly lowers the melting temperature of the solder and more importantly it keeps it molten for much longer. In practice this means that you can remove SMD components with temperatures even under 150 degrees Celsius. I have a small circuit board here that I'm going to attempt to remove the 328 chip in the middle. I will need the help of my extra eyes for this because it is very small. First thing to do would be to apply a little flux. The chip quick does appear to be thick or blobby when you're applying it, but that's the way it's been designed and it is easily removed from the PCB afterwards. Just using my uh, pick tool now just to dislodge and remove the chip from the PCB. Chip quick does stay molten for considerably longer than the standard solder. Once you have successfully removed the component, it's time to clean up the pads from any remaining solder or chip quick. And just one little additional pad there to clean. This is why you need a magnifying lens. And just to finish off, just a little bit of IPA, just to clean the pads. It has done a remarkably good job. There is no damage to any of the little pads. If I did not have access to any of the other soldering stations and only occasionally needed to remove multi-pin ICs, then definitely Chip Quick is a very useful tool. And now a quick recap. The soldering braid or solder wick is cheap but not reusable. You start with a clean segment each time. It can be hard to get solder out of pinholes or plated through holes using it. And it can be easy to damage PCB tracks if you're not careful. It's slow, but definitely a must have in your toolbox. Desoldering pumps and solder suckers are cheap. They come in a good range of styles and sizes. You do need two hands to use them, but they are great for working small parts and getting solder out of pinholes and plated through holes. Removed components can generally be reused. It is slow, but again, it's a must-have in your toolbox. Desoldering stations and hot air stations start at around £40. They allow very quick removal with less stress on both components and PCB. You can use them with one hand. They are great for working on small parts and getting solder out of pin and plated through holes. The removed components can generally be reused. Hot air can also be used for SMD soldering. 
chip quick is expensive, but its very low melting temperature does allow removed components to be reused. It is slow and really only useful if a hot air station is not available. And finally, a word about safety. Never touch the element or tip of your soldering iron unless you know it's cold. 350 Celsius will definitely burn you. The smoke is mostly from flux. This can be irritating and can aggravate asthma. You should avoid breathing it in and try moving your head to the side of your work, not directly above it. You should always work on a fireproof or non-flammable surface and always return your soldering iron to its stand immediately after use. And finally, always allow joints and components a moment or two to cool down before you touch them. I hope you have enjoyed this short talk and gained a useful insight into some of the tools and techniques required for successful desoldering in the home workshop. This talk has been something of a vertical learning curve for me. Please forgive some of my clumsy soldering iron techniques. Trying to get clear close-up views for the camera and smartphone was at times challenging to say the least. If you are just starting out with electronics and home brewing projects, the club would like your suggestions on areas you'd like to see covered in future club talks. When the coronavirus lockdown has ended, we will get back to regular club meetings at the Boathouse in Grimsport. The committee are planning a series of club builds of varying technical proficiencies. To finish, I'd just like to say thank you for watching and I look forward to meeting you on the air. Best 7 threes.